Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to another conversation about creating peace in troubling times with Kit Miller. I'm here, Thomas Stokel, with my friend Kit. Kit, can you hear me? I can. Thanks, Thomas. Great. How are you today, Kit? Hmm. I'm feeling thoughtful. I'm good. Glad to be here. Mm, good. Good, good, good. Well, we will start off um, with some gratitude Wait. as always. How are you doing? Me? Oh, I'm doing wonderfully well. I'm preparing for a party tonight, so I'm feeling um, excited and energized and I'm also very glad to be having this conversation. I'm glad. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are new to this conversation, we start with a bit of gratitude and then Kip will share some um, thoughts and insights with us for about 20-25 minutes and then we have lots of time for your questions. Um, you'll see if you're on the web, you'll have an, uh, a box, if you will, to add in questions at any time you would like to ask a question. Um, and today we want to make it a bit more interactive, so there is also another um, feature where you can put your hand up and you can unmute your microphone and you can ask your question to get yourself personally. So we'll try that out today and see how that goes. Um, but yeah, gratitude. Kit, what's one thing you're grateful for today or recently? Um, while I answer, um, can, can, we do, can we ask folks who are on the call too to just type in what they're grateful for? Yes. Thank you for reminding me again. Um, yeah. By all means, share what you're grateful for and we'll read some of those out as well. Yeah. Well, I guess just because we were talking about it, I'm, I'm grateful for gratitude itself. Um, mm. I have found it to be really a lifeline, even on the hardest days, that I can choose to put my attention on what's working, on what support is there, even during the hard times. You know, even during the worst days, there's parts of my life that other people would love to have, even on my hardest days. When I put my attention on gratitude, um, it empowers me, it changes my perspective. So um, there's this little quick William Blake quote that gratitude is heaven itself, and I'm on board with that idea. So today I'm just going to be grateful for gratitude. Hmm. Nice. Um, well, I am grateful for... I think I'm grateful for my brain today. I was thinking about this a little bit beforehand, and um, my brain does so much stuff. It like helps me contribute in interesting ways. It automatically tells my heart when to beat without me having to worry about my heart stop beating. Um, mm. And it allows me to kind of experience the world in, a, in an incredible way. So I'm very grateful for uh, my brain and uh, everything it does for me and, and for other people, I guess, too. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I've got one here saying, grateful for Kit Miller, putting attention on gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> we, could get to pretty, we could get pretty circular here, can't we? I really like, you know, I've, I've already said this, but I, you know, I always want to mention the land that I'm, that I live on, the land that mm -hmm. I work on is, is um, part of the, the, Iroquois Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee people, and um, I'm, I'm super moved every time I have the privilege of being in a gathering um, of folks from that extraordinary nation um, that incorporated the geographical area now known as New York State, as well as parts of Pennsylvania and a little bit of Ontario, Canada. Um, and every gathering, including the one I went to last Saturday, immediately after this call, um, always, the, every every gathering begins and ends with a lengthy expression of gratitude, hmm. and uh, I I really believe that like that the cultures that are sustainable, that the individuals who are sustain are able to sustain, they they keep their eye on gratitude. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, speaking of the land, we've got one here saying I'm grateful to be joining from. Jacksonville, where I'm looking after my grandson today, his sweet spirit is always renewing for me. Hmm. <laughs> Lucky you to have a grandson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm grateful for the unexpected blessing of friends, even friends who I haven't spent much time with in years, letting me borrow their cars while back in Wisconsin from New Zealand. 
grateful for the support and for the connection I have with them and the chance to spend time with some of them in person. Uh, grateful for insight, even when it hurts to see it, it can be healing if I stay with it. Mm. Mm. Yep. Grateful for a warm house today. <laughs> yeah. I hear that. <laughs> Great. Well, um, Kate, what would you like to share with us today? Hmm. Well, I, I wanted to speak a little bit about um, uh, creating a lived practice of nonviolence. And I was I mentioned it, I think, a little bit last week, but um, I'm, my attention was drawn to it again today. I don't know about all of you guys, but boy, my inbox, or at, least, or at least one of my emails that where I get a lot of sort of the the request for support from groups doing many, many different kinds of of activism, um, environmental, human rights, um, you know, really the whole gamut of activism. There's just uh, an incredible amount of um, freaking out emails coming through <laughs> in my inbox right now. You know, people freaking out about so many, so many things, so many things, certainly many things to do with political perspectives and appointees, but also just, you know, the state of the world and just specific cases and situations of people from someone who's been wrongfully incarcerated to someone who, you know, was denied medical care. You know, just, I, I, I'm guessing all of you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it can be overwhelming. Every, sometimes I just read my email and I can hardly believe it. You know, if I, if I looked, if I took my world perspective from that glance and that, that particular email where there's so many worthy causes shouting out their urgency and shouting out that kind of the sky is falling, um, I think I, I, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I could keep going. So I want to name some of the things that I think for me like can be grounding daily practices um, that, that really have support me to experience myself as being rooted in the midst of all of that and in the midst of you know very, very like busy days with lots going on and, and still wanting to be able to show up and be full, full-hearted present for what's happening. So I just want to say some of these things. And first, I always want to express um, and remember to express gratitude to all the people whose shoulders I stand on. So, so many of these ideas, a lot of them kind of came from my own tinkering with my own life. But then, of course, so many of the ideas that all of us lean on came always from other people. Sometimes we remember who they are and sometimes not. But this particular moment, I'm so glad to name um, Dr. Michael Nagler who's like generous, um, wonderful advocacy for nonviolence and um, through his writing, through his work at the Meta Center. Um, he's just always been such a, a lovely, generous, you know, mentor to me and I, I suspect hundreds of other people who are interested in this, this, this field. So years ago, I don't even remember when, some, somewhere with him, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, well, what do you actually do every day? To to change your, your how you're how you're hardwired, because I we you know we're living in some respects you know you know especially in in our sixth decade seventh decade now of of really in the grip of of a military industrial complex you know that Eisenhower spoke of so prophetically just in the just after World War II you know we we're really living in 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 a particular time and cultural frame now where we're so deeply, deeply educated into, you know, a holding a perspective um, that makes us, you know, believe that violence is inevitable and pleasurable and necessary, that consumption is one of our jobs, um, that individualism is the truth and that we need to look to ourselves to cite all of our problems within ourselves and so many of those things that, like for me, were just they were just shellacked into my understanding, not as ideas or perspectives, but as just as reality. And so the, some of the things that helped me to pull away from those ideas, I'm going to list here. Um, so every day I'd, I'd, I'd take some time to learn about nonviolence as a kind of a, like a daily vitamin to counteract the idea of violence, as I said a minute ago, of, of inevitable, necessary, pleasurable. Today's um, 
today I, I'm, I'm reading this marvelous book about the, the 1963 Birmingham Children's March. And, um, you know, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with this particular aspect of U.S. history, because if you're like me, it was not even mentioned. But, you know, children as young as nine years old were engaged in political activism and trained in nonviolence way, you know, during, in order to be able to engage in the way that they did. And so today, you know, I was reading a story of a, of a, of a little, of a girl, Arnetta Streeter, who is 14 years old, and she's, uh, she was getting trained to be one of the protesters, as so many of the children were back in Birmingham then. Um, and she wrote about, and she talked about that seeing King and him speaking about love your, he didn't just say love your neighbor, he also said love your enemy. And then she talked about that in 1962 when um, King was speaking in Birmingham, um, a young man, a young white man, I'm reading from the book, a young white man named Rory James jumped onto the stage and attacked him with brass knuckles, slugging him in the back and jaw. And rather than return the blows or even cover his face, King dropped his hands by his side and looked at his assailant. Other ministers rushed to restrain James, but King stopped them. Don't touch him, he cried. We have to pray for him. King put his arm around the man who had been attacking him. They talked quietly. The man, a member of the American Nazi Party, started crying and admitted that he'd come there to prove that King was not nonviolent. And King chose not even to press charges. There, I've read a very, very, very strikingly similar story of Gandhi um, in the South Africa days. For me, reading a story like that um, is just food for my journey today, and um, and just re and deepening my understanding of how many times in history people have looked squarely into the face of chaotic and challenging times and gotten through it in ways that are triumphant. And we haven't learned about them in schools. We haven't learned. So I'm curious, one, I just want to take a minute and see if there's any a couple of people that would want to name their favorite places where they've learned about nonviolence, because I'd like to learn from you. If you can either type it or say it, but tell me, teach me. Yeah, great. And my people are um, responding to that kit. I didn't know that story. It's an incredible story. I mean, that's right. a, a true demonstration of, of nonviolence. I mean, that's phenomenal. Um, wow. And, and I will say one place I've, um, I'll name two places actually where I've learned about nonviolence. Um, one is through my time um, at Findhorn and the other through my time uh, with you at the Gun Institute and with all your lovely staff. Um, for those of you who don't know, at the Gun Institute for Nonviolence in Rochester, Kit has a staff of 20-somethings and some teenagers who teach this work. Um, and oh, it's, yeah, I've learned so much from my time in Rochester and it's been such an enriching experience um, as a result. So, um, yeah, it's been pretty amazing. Um, I will say um, two things quickly. Um, one is, once again, hoping people can see where they can put their hand up and that's, that's an option if someone wants to. Um, if you can't see that, maybe type me a message and say, I can't see that, and then I'll know that it's not there, but I'm, I'm assuming it is there. And once again, at any time, if you do have any questions or would like to make any comments, um, you can also um, type those in and, and you know, speak to me and Kit, because we want it to be as interactive as possible. Um, well, no one's, no one's come through yet with anything yet, Kit, so maybe they're still typing. So should we move on and we can come back to that? Sure, yeah, yeah. So so that's, I want to name my first idea is every day spend a little time learning about nonviolence in whatever ways, whatever frame. And thank goodness there's such riches um, mm -hmm. online and, and so many books. And, you know, and, and I, I advise you to read King and Gandhi yourself. Read Mandela yourself. Read Bacha Khan's words yourself. Read, read the source material, mm -hmm. not just the, what the people have written about the source material. I, that for me, reading them, their words directly, and thank goodness there's a lot out there. That both of them were prolific. The second thing is um, I want to recommend is that um, every day take some time to slow down 
and know yourself through some quiet time or prayer, yoga or meditation. Um, just and and I I imagine there's many of you who are already striving to do this many days or most days. Um, and I, I just want to I want to affirm and thank you for that um, for that effort and and ask you to to re realize how how important it is to do that. That very much relates to something I talked about on the first week. That project think before reacting notion. The that to that how much freedom in the world it is in that space between our stimulus and our response. And if we don't give ourselves the time to develop the muscles, um, the spiritual muscles, the spiritual practice. It's a practice because we're practicing non-reactivity. We're practicing reflection. We're practicing openness. Um, and one of my ways that I'm doing it right now, because I like to change things up, is um, like right now my morning quiet time is including memorizing a Roka poem. And um, I've just been so deeply into this poem um, in the last days that it's like it almost helps me to examine my conscience right now like how how am I living am I living in a way that I like am I happy with it um, this is a particular poem from the book of a monastic life um, and if there's time I'll, I'll share it with you today if that works but so for me so spending some time to to be quiet to know yourself um, to learn a passage by heart that has deep meaning, yoga, meditation, a critical part of being able to live nonviolence. So my third idea for a live practice of nonviolence, which helps, which comes in part, as I said, from Dr. Michael Nagler, is every day take an action of, of any size. Every day take an action of any size to make the world better. Listening to people who are distressed and to people whose perspectives differ from you especially counts. But active service of any kind counts. Pay attention to your opportunities to be of service. One thing that I've started doing is I, um, I often don't have cash with me. And as I'm running around, I'm, I'm running all the time into people who are, are begging on the streets here and where I live. Um, and I, I also just, you know, sometimes just giving money doesn't feel like it, it gives the kind of care that I like. So, like, I carry a box of energy bars around with me. And I love giving energy bars to people. Um, they're good, healthy kind that are sort of sweet, too. So if someone has a sweet tooth, they'll like it. But it's good, healthy food, and it just gives me, like, a sense of joy to do that. And, and I, I'm not doing that for them. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for me because I don't want to be the kind of person who is able to walk past someone who's asking for my help and not respond. So that's that's a third thing is every day take an action of of any size to make the world better. Um and again, I know everyone I'm speaking with right now that there's like there's thousands of acts that all of us together have chosen to take that have made the world better. Just just for a minute, just think about all those thousands of acts. It's extraordinary. It's happening all the time, all around us. It's one of the things that we can be grateful for. Don't forget about that every day. Take care of your own self that way. Um, I don't know, tell me anything, Thomas, anything you want to say about that before I move on? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, we actually had some people um, finish with their typing, so some people have contributed um, some of their thoughts based on when you asked a moment ago to think about where people are learning about nonviolence. Um, and it says here, um, a force more powerful is a great resource, either the book or the movie, plus Michael Nagler's book and so many others. Yep. Um, right. Uh, someone says they've seen the Dalai Lama behave virtually the same way as King um, when a shouting intruder stormed a stage on which he was sitting and teaching. He immediately turned his attention to the man and spoke quietly with him and then he left. Hmm. Hmm. Um, someone said here, I'm reading the diary of Etty Hellison. 
Yeah. Who'd been found? Yeah. You know Eddie Hallison, kid? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, that might be a good one then to read everyone. <laughs> Who developed a deep spiritual connection and love for life and humans in times of great fear when she yeah. was already expecting to be a victim of the Holocaust, being a young Jewish woman in Amsterdam. And these days I'm following the water protesters at Standing Rock, who I find so deeply inspiring in their way of mm. spiritual nonviolence. Mm. Beautiful. Um, and There's so many questions. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been following Standing Rock as well, and it's um, very cool to see the, the spiritual element of that come through so strongly and to be so strongly encouraged of everyone who's attending um, to follow that practice. Yep, yep. And then, of course, this week, you know, I think many people have been moved by, by veterans who have decided mm -hmm. to go out there and stand in defense of those, of the defenders. Um, and makes me really, I think of, um, I think it was Angela Davis speak, saying, you know, that there's, there aren't struggles, there's one struggle and they're all related to each other. And the sooner that we realize that, the better. So, and of course that goes back to King speaking about um, justice is indivisible. So we can't, we can't just say, well, we want justice over here, but it's okay that it's not over there. When, when once you become committed to justice, you see it anywhere, and it matters to you, even if it's not your quote-unquote issue. So it's like all week long I've been thinking about the veterans being out there, standing in solidarity with Native Americans from throughout this continent and, and many other people too. It's a, it's a beautiful living example right now of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know this about this, but it's about to get a little more beautiful. Um, the Morton County Sheriff's Department requesting donations. Um, those are, I think that's the Sheriff's Department who are um, on the other side of the protesters in this um, situation. And the Native American water protectors uh, are giving the Sheriff's Department supplies. <laughs> so, Perfect. Um, yeah, I think that's... That's a kind of creative, <laughs> out-of-the-box thinking of that... Right. that that nonviolence is all about. That's I think I might have mentioned was uh, already that <clears throat> you know Gandhi spoke when about the British when asked you know about having um, the British in India. He said I would love more British people to move to India, but not as our colonizers. They can be our friends. I, we would like many many people. More people could come from England and Britain to live with us. But uh, so come on over. But not as our colonizers. So that you know, there was this sort of automatic assumption that Gandhi would say, "No, all English, you know, all British, out, out. You know, we want our country to ourselves." And he just turned that on his head. <laughs> he said, "Come on over, but not as our colonizers, not mm -hmm. as our oppressors." Sweet. Nice. Yeah, I mean, just just um, talking about this, these creative solutions to nonviolence, kid. I mean, I know that's uh, so important when we look to counteract such a incredible force that is, you know, war and the mentality that seems now very ingrained in our societies um, and, and of course the military industrial complex, you know, that kind of creativity um, is what's needed to help break that force. Um, and I've been thinking about, and I know you know about the nonviolent army of, you know, 100,000 Pakistanis, um, Muslims. That Khan was leading, and, and you can talk more to that. Um, but I was thinking about this conflict, say in Ukraine, and how you could creatively get in between those two fighting forces, and um, you know, like what well, you're getting flatbed trucks, putting bands on the back of them, and just having concerts <laughs> up and down the front. I'm not saying that's a, a good idea or the idea. I'm just thinking about you know creative ways to really get in between conflict and. Mm -hmm. And also oh. connect the humanity of the people mm -hmm. and, and music, food, um, those are some of the, the things that, you know, we're hardwired, you know, our brains recognize that as, as, as community and as, as humans, we're, it's very hard for us to resist the fact of, you know, someone offering us food, someone playing mm -hmm. music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the old parts of our brain can kick in a little bit, and the new parts, the front part of our brain that says, nope, I have to obey, can have a little bit of a breather. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so maybe rock bands and giving out 
hot sandwiches um, along the front, both sides. That would be uh, interesting. Um, we have a couple more things coming through, actually. Um, one more book recommendation, uh, Lake Ashton, uh, Reweaving Our Human Fabric. Yeah, that's a great book. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Oh, and, and someone, uh, Jean just said here, the meta team is going to Standing Rock. Um, there is a whole Shanti Sena network and the Nonviolent Peace Force doing what you're talking about. Oh. Mm hmm Yep. Great nice thing. I like this. It's wonderful to see these ideas are already happening, and I look forward to seeing that. I mean, I've, I've thought about going to Stan and Rock, but I haven't um, made that commitment as yet. Great, Kat. That was the um, third one that you covered off there, paying attention to your opportunities to contribute to making the world a better place. Yep. Um, and, and then the last one I'll name for today, and then we can open it for questions. <clears throat> and I think, I'm again, I may, I may be slightly repeating myself, but I'm, I forgive. I forgive myself for that now and then, is I really want to uh, counsel people to think about the consum their consumption of media. Um, because for so many of us, and I know it's true for me, and I, I ask other folks, you know, every day often the consumption, especially of mainstream media, um, often can make us fearful, um, distrusting each other, distrusting our sense of solutions and possibilities. Um, so I want to I want to just really say that one of the uh, one piece of the live practice of nonviolence is to be be thoughtful about the stories and information that you take in. Um, be thoughtful about consuming information, um, especially when you're doing it rather automatically. That that leads to those kind of states. Those are not that's not an empowering move. Um, be thoughtful about where where you take in news. Um, and again, I want to mention Yes Magazine. You know, that's other kinds of news that's also true um, and that can help you to feel like that we're moving towards, you know, finding solutions uh, for our, we can become solutionaries, as a while talks about. Um, so just be thoughtful about that um, because your, your well-being and your, your capacity to be creative and alert and alive is important, and um, and able to be creative, you know, um, those are all critical critical qualities right now. So these are some of the these are four of ideas um, that <clears throat> every day take turn some some time to learn about nonviolence. Every day make some time to slow down and know yourself through quiet time of some kind. Every time, take some action of some size to make the world better. Every day, pay attention to your consumption of media. Um, from the study that I've had, my, all of my heroes' lives were influenced by daily choices and their and disciplines that were that over time yielded their extraordinary lives. Uh, so, in my search for guidelines for daily living, um, these I, I pay attention to the choices because I know that over time. Um, if I chose to do, if I choose to do this every day, or choose to strengthen whatever I'm doing in this in these kinds of areas already, then over time the trajectory of my ability, my presence, my com compassion, my wholeheartedness will change. I trust it. Um, so I recommend even a 30-day experiment with these four ideas as an opportunity to change your life's trajectory and. Maybe to escape from what might be a sort of orbital pull of, habit of, of habitual energy and in, in our cultural norms, and I believe that also writing about that effort would make it even more fruitful. Um, so I have a whole other piece around being a learner um, that I want to share, but I, I think I'm going to stop for today and see what kind of questions and ideas other people want to talk about today. Sure thing. Um, well, yeah. Please do if you have any questions or, or comments, and um, you can type them in now. Now, I'm having I've had one person say they can't see this hands up thing, <laughs> and I'm not sure if that's the case for everybody. Um, so maybe just type in if you can't see it, and then I know that you, you can't see it. Um, we have a question here. It says, "Do you have any other suggestions other than Yes Magazine for news sources?" Hmm. Well, I used to like Ode magazine, uh, spelled O-D-E, 
<clears throat> I think, well, generally, yes. I don't know if Ode is still around. I haven't looked up, look it up for a while. Maybe somebody else could while we're online together. But um, they, they did a similar sort of um, reporting of, of the good ideas that were out there in the solutions. Um, so look, look for them. Um, I know that there, there, I know in the UK there is a newspaper that was focused on like the positive news and good news, so, uh, and being able to report on on solutions and ideas. Um, I'm thinking of this book um, also, uh, How to Change the World, by David Bornstein, um, Social Entrepreneurs and the Power of New Ideas. In the, in the introduction to this book, Bornstein talks about how critical it is that we be able to name solutions. He said, you know, in his his thinking and talking, the talking he's done around the world, um, he says the ratio of problem-focused information com as compared to solution-focused information on the media is completely out of balance. It distorts reality, it's dispiriting, and it deprives people of the knowledge they need to properly assess risks and recognize opportunities. If you were asked to list 10 problems faced in the world, how long would it take? Two minutes? How long would it take for you to list 10 solutions? So since I read Bornstein's um, words, that, that's really made a lot of sense to me. And I, I don't know, you know how that, if that makes sense to other people. But um, we, need, we, need to, we need to rebalance the information that we're taking in. And if, there, and if it's not being offered to us, maybe we need to go out and find it and broadcast it to other people. Nice. Um, some people have said, uh, oh, that UK magazine is called uh, Resurgence. Um, by the way, that's what Roz said. And then there's also, um, Jean's recommended the Good News Network. Um, yes. And yep. another place for news. Great. Yep. Cool. Yep, they're all they're on that, the Good News Network. Yep. That's true. Great ideas. Cool. And Thank just you. just as far as this um this hands up thing says, um I've got the admin view of the world, so I can't see what um you see as attendees, but um Jean said here <clears throat> for hands maybe they could click on the layout and then they can see the little hand symbol in a separate little bar. Same little bar that has the icon for the control panel. Um, they can see where to type if they click on show control panel, um, which is the top icon of that little sidebar. So hopefully that is useful to anyone who's wishing to um, jump on the phone and, and say a few words or ask that question in person. Um, cool, so Kit, I'm interested to know if, if you had a sort of a 101, people who are interested in nonviolence who are perhaps new to nonviolence, and in particular your first point today about um, you know, making a daily practice to learn about nonviolence every day. What resources um, and tools would you kind of recommend as the, you know, the, I wouldn't say essential, but a good recommended starting point or, or some good tools for that? Hmm. Well, we've got a, a staff picks page on the Gandhi Institute website. So that's that's one place to to look, and we're we're refreshing that as people here are always learning different things in relation to social justice and nonviolence. Um, the Meta Center, M E T T A, the Meta Center website is just a treasure house of information, and I think especially there, I've I've often had new staff here take their online nonviolence 101 course, um, which is a free learning. Um, they do request a donation, and I hope you'll make a donation to support their good work there. But um, I think that that is a is a terrific. There's a kind of his, history version of it, and then a then a more current version of it. Um, I think that the the work, the research work on principled nonviolence, or I'm sorry, on on the effectiveness of strategic nonviolence, which is really to make use of nonviolence for affecting political change which was documented um, through the work of Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stevens um, in their, their research. And Erica Chenoweth's uh, work, I think, is super important. And there's a TED Talk, which there you can hear 
um, the reflection of uh, from Erica and, and um, it's a TED talk by Erica Chenoweth uh, reflecting on the work that she and Maria Stevens did together. Um, you know, definitively proving that um, strategic nonviolence is actually um, more effective. Um, I think just because we are on the receiving end of so much Islamophobia uh, in the sta in the states, especially, but I think also in other places, um, I really recommend Eknath Aswaran's book called Nonviolent Soldier of Islam. And that this book um, focuses on the incredibly important story of um, Khan Ghaffar Khan, are also known as Bacha Khan, B A D S H A H. Uh, a few minutes ago, Thomas, you made reference to the, a nonviolent army, and uh, this is the story in part of the world's first nonviolent army that was Muslim. 100,000 people who took lifetime vows as a result of the of Khan's extraordinary leadership and vision. If we understood more deeply that Islam holds the capacity for this sort of extraordinary commitment to nonviolence, I think it would do the world a lot of good. So there's lots of it. I mean, I'm just sitting here looking at my bookshelf. I could sit here for an hour and tell you <laughs> things I'd love for you all to read, but those are a few. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one to I actually recommend um, is on that kit and her team developed, which is the um, Gandhi deck of cards. And it's um, how many cards are in that deck? Is it 40, 50? Yep. Uh, what have we got? Like 43, I think. Yep. 43 cards. And they've got a beautiful, um, most likely a black and white picture of an image um, from some period of Gandhi's life. And then on the back of that, um, is, uh, is, of this card is a, is a sort of short story or message and I keep that um, deck of cards by my bed and I, I pull one of those cards, the top one, um, read about something from Gandhi's life and then put it at the bottom of the deck um, of cards and it's a really nice way to um, you know, start or finish your day um, with uh, a lesson from, from Gandhi and a, a non-violence. Um, so that's Pretty cool. I couldn't recommend that resource more. I mean, I know that Kit and her team spent some time doing that, and they use it in schools and all their webinars around the world. Sorry, all their um, workshops and stuff they do. And and can, they can people can buy those online at the website, right? Yeah, these are those are great. They're easy to buy at our website, and um, <clears throat> yeah, great holiday gift to um, uh, and yeah, they explore. Um, perspectives on Gandhi's life. Um, Khan is mentioned in there, uh, developing nonviolent qualities, and um, met much of the copy from it uh, uh, derives from interviews with Arun Gandhi, who founded the institute here and was, is a grandson and elder here. Um, so yeah, that's a really good strategy for breaking breaking down this kind of information into little bite-sized pieces. That was part of why we made it. I'm glad you mentioned the holiday um, reference there for Christmas because uh, you might get a little order from me from a, for a handful of us to give out to some people as a nice gift. That's a really good idea, actually. Hmm. Um, cool. Well, by all means, keep um, firing away questions. I'm going to just look back at the attendees list and see if anyone's got their hand up. As yet, no, oh, cool. Um, so, what happens Kit, when people have you seen in people's lives when they've taken on these practices? You know, maybe some of the newer staff have come to the institute and when they've started to do these things and um, how it's affected them, or any people have attended your um, courses. I'm just curious to know, or when you don't do these things and what effect that has on you or on others. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm regularly hearing from people, um, both youth that we work with as well as um, as adults, about you know their uh, uh, the excitement of a of a shift in you know in perspective. Um, one one guy that actually just went to a, a course here, uh, very hilarious, plain spoken individual. Um, I'm just going to grab an email he just sent to me that I really appreciated. Um, 
He said, you know, I had no idea about the positive consequences of conflict. For me, conflict had only been something to avoid in hope of preserving the stability of my relationships. However, uh, through the time in the class with you, I, I became aware of the many benefits, not only of following my feelings into conflicts and the many wonderful, previously unimaginable results, but I also became more comfortable being vulnerable. Thank you again for this incredible experience in transforming relationships. And then I just got a follow from him that he had, he went home for Thanksgiving and had a remarkable conversation with his father. And um, for the, like this, he said it was just a breakthrough uh, with his dad. It's, he, he was could he was shocked at what he was able to get get to with his dad. So, you know, and we get um, oh god, so many so many little notes, and uh, it's it's a wonderful part of the work that we do here. Is the sense that we're really making some tangible differences in people's lives. Um, yep, yep. So. That, that would actually be interesting to, to talk about at this point. The, um, you know, I think we, I don't know if we have a culture of avoiding conflict, but um, because in some ways we, we obviously don't, but it, it's certainly in well, call it polite society for want of a better term, um, you know, I would tend to not walk away from conflict, but yeah, that's my natural tendency is part British, rather reserved, part New Zealand, also reserved, not wanting to um, have conflict or experience conflict for myself or for anyone else. And so, you know, we, we might have conditioning that means that we don't um, in, engage in conflict and therefore things, you know, remain below the surface, things don't get resolved and, you know, that's obviously not an ideal situation. Yeah. And this idea of um, walking towards conflict and, and, and what would you say to people who, you know, um, might think like I probably still do and um, I certainly have in the past uh, with my view of conflict is starting to be avoided. What would be some steps or a little process they can keep in mind as they become aware that they might be trying to avoid a conflict and it might be better in fact to walk towards that conflict? Yeah, well I mean the, the first thing I want to say is I always want to acknowledge our conditioning um, and I want people to just be able to be freer than they are. I want I want myself to be freer and then I want all of us to be freer. I want us to be able to make to choose for ourselves um, out of our own individual uh, lives, our precious individual choice, like this one life that we have. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. And so <clears throat> when I see many people acting from their cultural conditioning, I just always want to like lovingly notice that with them. Um, and then also ask them not to judge themselves for having it, because none of us can not have cultural conditioning. I mean, we are these porous little creatures when we're born, and we, we absorb all these messages. And I think many, many of us absorbed, you know, right through the pores of our bodies, the idea that, you know, being around conflict isn't safe, that people who bring conflict are bad people. And so, of course, you know, we distance ourselves from that. Um, and so we're... Like we have this very lopsided, what I would call like balance sheet. Um, you know, when we think about ex walking towards a conflict, as as my friend Dominic Barter, you know, it's a phrase I just I first heard him use many years ago. Or even like thinking about a conflict, all we all we know to do is list all the reasons why why we shouldn't go there. And that was that 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 whole side of the balance sheet was pretty much provided to us by our culture. Um, you know, better to leave it alone because it could get worse. Um, you, you'll be branded as someone who brings conflict if you name it, you know, like all of those things. But what I would urge people to do is to actually get acquainted with the other side of the balance sheet. So if you walked towards conflict, if you were someone who knew, you know, how to, how to really engage with people when things were challenging, what would that yield? Um, so... You know, some of my own experiments with that is that it's yielded more rich relationships with people because when I've named problems or discomfort, um, it ends up actually lending itself to more trust because people believe that I'll, you know, that I'll tell them the truth. Um, I that I, I'm not just someone who says what they would want to hear. So it's it's often led to a lot more trust with people. Um, 
it's also led internally to a strengthening of my own sense of integrity and wholeheartedness, um, feeling sort of more spiritually aerodynamic, if you will. Um, you know, the whole idea that Gandhi said, my life is my message. So when we're able to really be in connection to our own truth um, in relation to, to conflict is, and anything else, it just, you know, it yields a, a more, I think, efficient, effective, creative life. Um, so I want to say, um, again, I'm sorry, I do so much teaching and speaking, I, sometimes I forget what I've said where, but I really want to, I actually stay away from the word conflict, um, even internally, but especially out loud, because people, that's such a culturally loaded word in the circles that I travel in, not in everybody's circles, I'm just naming my own experience here. So I don't talk about conflict. I, talk, I say I see a pattern emerging. I think that there might be a dilemma here that it would be useful for us to look at so that we can restore our sense of you know, efficiency and effectiveness and, and joy of being together. So, um, so those are a couple of ideas. Recognize your, how deep your conditioning is. Recognize the costs of, of not going to see, say those things. And and then uh, you know figure out um, you know who you want to be in the world and how does conflict and avoiding conflict relate to that. So there's there's a lot to say about that. Those are just a couple of ideas. And I mean Thomas, you've hung around with me a lot when we've talked about this kind of stuff. I don't know, or from your experience, what are some of the things that you think would be useful to share? I mean I think it's starting with awareness and just you know. The reminder we had him yesterday about um, being aware of when we're avoiding conflict and, and and noticing it, and then thinking about okay, I need to walk towards this. And I think nonviolent communication as a practice has been immensely helpful to me. That once I know I need to have that conversation, giving me some tools to you know be able to have it. Um, so you know, seeing what what needs people have and and why people are having those feelings, I think as a framework, it's been really useful for me to navigate some of the trickier conversations that I've had and so I'm immensely grateful for that skill set. Um, it's, you know, conversations with my own father and with my parents and with strangers and just sort of gives you the tools that you um, need to be able to navigate some of these trickier conversations that we have in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes you know we make up excuses. Oh, I don't really want to take, and I'm, you know, and I'm not, I'm not just speaking about this metaphorically. I have all this conditioning, you know. So I, I want to swerve around a problem situation. I don't want to deal with it. I tell myself I don't want to take the time. Please raise your hand if you've ever told yourself that. I mean, that's a pretty universal one. I'm not going to take the time. And yet, what I find, and you know, especially when we do mediations here for groups where there's been a, you know, a fairly significant breakdown is that basically what people did is they avoided conflict for so long and so many things were left unaddressed that finally it blows up. Mm. And and good work and and sometimes really, you know, critical resources of of money and time end up getting wasted. So I think it's super helpful for people to recognize that if you conflicts deferred don't mean that con a conflict is resolved. It sometimes just means it's going to come back later and it's going to be a lot harder to deal with. So I say, you know, to try to name things as fast, as early as you can. Um, if that's a trust builder. You don't need to have a solution to a conflict before you name it. You can just say, I'm seeing this as, a, as an issue. Do you share that perspective with me? I don't have an idea yet about it, but I just wanted to name it out of care for you and care for me both. Um, so you don't have to wait until you have your perfect solution. It's actually quite honest and creative, I think, sometimes to not wait. Uh, that way you hold the problem together with the other person not and not think that you're supposed to know all the answers. Maybe this is just me having this conditioning because I'm an oldest child in the family and I always think I'm supposed to show up with all the answers. So, we have a comment here actually. Um, 
and says, I, I struggle to, sorry, I struggle with trying to bring up conflict without feeling like I'm trying to change someone or something. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, sometimes we are trying to change the circumstances. If, if something's not working for us and we want to make them better, um, I mean, just if, like, even the, we're so quick, and I'm not, I may be misinterpreting what I just heard, but we're so quick to give up on something if, it's, if we see it's only important to us. We, we forget how interdependent we are with each other. If it's not working for you, then, then, on a, then for me, on a, on a deeply moral basis, it's not working for the other person, even if they don't necessarily share that belief. So if it's not working for you, it's a good enough reason to say, hey, this isn't working for me. I want to speak about a way to change it. How is that for you to hear? And as you just named Thomas, you know, like the nonviolent communication practice is pretty stellar. But not non not nonviolent communication mechanically applied in terms of how you sentence you structure your sentence, but nonviolent communication applied as a as a framework of listening deeply and, um, for values and also you know holding that you you matter too that um, that everybody matters those I mean those are the perspectives that I think nonviolent helps to really foster and strengthen nice um, we have a question here um, from Pat with so many important issues and limited time and resources how can we best determine where to focus when? What's dearest in my heart, critical to the moment, affects the people, the most people, or most likely to realistically affect change? So I guess it's that what's dearest to my heart, critical to the moment, and affects the most people, or what's most realistically going to affect change? Hmm. I don't know. I, I have such faith in what's dear to our hearts. Um, and there's so much value in being unrealistic. So that's my answer, Pat. <laughs> that's an awesome answer. I, 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 um, yeah. I thought you might say something like that, but that was, that was good. That was good. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I was a rely, or reliably uh, obscure or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Reliably obscure, I like it. Um, cool, well I'm conscious of uh, time, so we've got about five um, minutes left. Um, uh, should we Should we actually, oh one comment came through here, she said, um, still remembering Kit's quote this summer, walk towards the baby. Yeah. Have consciousness about the consequence of not having the conversation needed. Um, which ties obviously into what you were saying before about you know if we don't have these conversations, there are some pretty dire consequences that don't go away. Right, right, and that's the other side of the balance sheet um, to keep in mind that. So if we don't do it, not then what might happen? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know, you know, and I really, you know, cutoffs and and families and relationships that are so painful, you know, breakdowns of different kind. So if we if we if we get good at taking care of the little things, um, then two things can happen: the little things have less of a chance to turn into big things, and we work out our skill set and we build enough trust between us that when we've had good outcomes working out little things, when bigger things come in, we can look at each other and and trust uh, we can handle this one. So working out conflicts when they're small does a couple of different really important things. Yeah, awesome. I'd love to hear some feedback from a couple of people if anything worked or didn't work for them as a, before we would say goodbye to each other today if folks are willing. Great I remain I'm kind of uh, amazed by how weird it is to just talk to a bunch of people on the phone in an empty office. <laughs> Seriously, not my usual MO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, please do type in some any feedback and um, Kit, uh, I'm sure, isn't unique in this, liking specific feedback. So um, it's one thing to say that was great. I enjoyed it. And it's, and it's one thing to say I really liked the, the four points of spiritual practice. So for me, actually, Kit, today, 
I really liked the story that you told about King. I think that's such a powerful story of him being attacked on stage. Mm -hmm. um, it was awesome. And I loved, once again, the specificity of um, these four points that we can take away and um, these book recommendations, you know, Nonviolent Soldier of Islam and so forth, were also really useful. So I'm grateful for those. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad. Cool. Yeah, I like specifics. I mean, I, I'm I'm a big, you know, obviously I enjoy philosophy and the big ideas, but, you know, I don't like it if I walk away with something and say, yeah, that was good, but now what do I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't, I, I really have a big wish to not contribute to more of that kind of thing. So I want people to go, oh, I, I know what I could do. I could do that, or this is a little different, and that makes me happy to think about those specific small steps because everything important starts in my opinion, with, with specific small steps. Great. Well, um, Lawrence has typed in, I like the doable specific suggestions. So, um, clearly resonating. Um, Kimberly's also typed in something she's grateful for. Um, some feedback here. I do really like the idea of not needing to already have a solution. Um, but to stay open to a solution being something that has worked out together and is mutually beneficial. Um, Great. Celebrate um, that you know that. Mm -hmm. um, cool, got a, uh, I've really loved getting all the ideas for continuing my nonviolent education, so needed to hear about facing conflict, I feel like I have it all it's sorted on the activist front, but so need to apply it in the personal realm as well, wow, mm -hmm. that's cool, um, and some thank yous coming through too, thank you, exclamation point, so that's good. Um, nice one. Uh, oh, uh, I love so much what you've said. I'm processing it. So I uh, find at the moment hard to name the moments. Glad to have taken notes to go back to. Take care of the little things as practice is the last thing I can remember now. Thank you. Um, I've been feeling fatigued by my usual role as the mediator and positive spin person, especially recently. I appreciate the encouragement to become a broadcaster more than a participant in people's discussions. Well, lots of people coming in. Okay, uh, I'm grateful for the idea that it is a practice to resist and regulate the culture's influences on all kinds of consumption. Nice. Um, some more thank yous. I appreciate uh, hearing you don't use the word conflict because it's so culturally loaded. Uh, your learnings from your actual experience are very helpful. Thank you. Are you feeling full, Kit? Does that sound lovely to you? It does sound lovely. <laughs> I'm grateful. Uh, really grateful. Because, you know, and every day of our lives is just this fabulous opportunity to keep practicing all this stuff, which is so great. And the, the, guess what? Like the hard days, the suffering, the times we get angry, the times people piss us off are just like the best practice. Um, and the times when things are going well, which we're, which, when which we tend to sort of ignore, not pay attention <laughs> to the fact that things are going well, is, is like the perfect time for us to practice the gratitude. So we can just continue to kind of just keep working out all these capacities all together. This is, you know, why it's called practice, spiritual practice. Can I can I share the Rilke poem as a closing? Would you object, Thomas, or is there more you want to do? Um, I would not object at all. I would, um, I would just say a couple, one last thing before we get into this wonderful poem. Um, Lawrence made a couple of suggestions, which is great, saying ask people to raise their hands if they agree with the statement. That's a nice idea. And we could also next time ask people to um, say a couple of sentences so we could unmute them and they could say a few sentences and, and contribute to the conversation that way. So thanks for those suggestions, Lauren. And if anyone else has any ideas for improvements, by all means do. Um, but we will end on this quote um, from Kit, so I'll just say a couple of closing statements. Um, if you'd like to contribute to Kit's work at the Gandhi Institute, you can go to their website and make a donation or buy some Gandhi decks uh, as presents for this Christmas. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, spread the word, and Kit, please close with this wonderful poem. Thank you. Um, so this is for... This this poem references God. So for anyone who doesn't who's not on board with the idea of God, I, I sincerely I, I and I mean this. I'm not being facetious. I apologize. 
Um, and then the other thing about this poem is that it's translated from the German, and they use the male pronoun for God. Um, so I'm not going to change that, but I'm well aware of both of those things as I share this offering with you. And this is the piece I've been memorizing, but um, just out of fear that I'll screw it up. <laughs> I'm not open. I'm not closing the book. I'm going to read it to you. Um, God speaks to each of us as he makes us and then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words we dimly hear. You, sent out beyond your recall, go to the limits of your longing. Embody me. Flare up like flame and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen to you. Beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. You remember this poem, Thomas? I love that poem. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Kit. Speak to you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.